Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Personality Type in Action. Just a few logistics before we get started. You are all on mute so that background noise is kept to a minimum. However, we do want your questions. There is a question pane in the webinar panel on the right-hand side where you can enter your questions. We have left some time for questions throughout the presentation, but feel free to type them in as they come to you. We have added this presentation in the handout section of the webinar panel, as well as some newly redesigned sample reports. Be sure to download those now if you haven't already. We are also recording this webinar, and it will be available on the MHS Talent YouTube channel for any colleagues who are unable to attend the live version. For those on the line new to MHS, a little about us and who we are. MultiHealth Systems is a global publisher of scientifically validated assessments in the clinical, education, public safety, and talent assessment markets. We are located in Toronto, Canada, and have been in business for over 30 years. In the talent space, we are most widely known for our work in emotional intelligence, and specifically the tool EQI 2.0. But we also have a diverse toolkit, including assessments and simulations on personality, leadership, entrepreneurship, change management, influence, and decision making. Now I'd like to share a little about our presenters today. Heil Rutledge is the president and principal consultant of OKA, an organizational development training and consulting firm specializing in leadership and team development. He is a leader in this field and specializes in the training and application of many different self-assessment tools, including the EQI and EQ360, as well as the Pyramid. Elnaz Rosania is a research scientist at MHS Assessments. She has a master's in industrial organizational psychology with experience in talent assessment, workforce development, and performance management. Elnaz was one of the leading researchers through the development and revision phases of the Pyramid Personality Integrator. And finally, myself, Rebecca Digby, a marketing communications specialist at MHS Assessments and also your moderator for today's webinar. And with that, I will turn this over to Elnaz to get us started. Wonderful, thank you, Becca. I'm very excited to be with you guys today. Welcome everyone, and I hope you find this presentation insightful and you get some takeaway by the end of it. So um, today we're going, we're going to talk about Pearman personality assessment and how we can put the information from this assessment into action. So first I will give you a quick overview of Pearman personality model and some of the powerful features of this tool. And after that, I will uh, walk you through some of the exercises that we can do with the Pearman results, such as team and leadership development. And at the end, we're gonna allocate some time to answer any questions you might have. Um, but now I would like to start with a poll question. So my question for you guys is, what statement best represent your knowledge and experience with type? Please note that no experience is required or assumed for you to be an active part of this discussion. So the first option is I'm curious about type, but would, um, don't know much about it. I have had some exposure to type. I know some basics. I have been fully exposed to type and I'm confident of my type preferences. I know type well and I'm certified in type rooted tools such as Pearman or MBTI. Okay, great. All right, um, let's take a couple of more seconds um, to see if we have more respondents. All right, perfect. So, all right, so basically, I see that majority of people on this call, there are um, new to type, and um, they have some, some of you guys have some exposure to type, know a little bit about type, and, and some of you guys um, uh, are familiar actually with the uh, personality assessment such as Pearman. That's perfect. So uh, now let's talk about how Pearman actually um, uh, talks about the core concept of type and, and, and how Pearman can be the first step for you to knowing your type. 
So Pierman personality has two main components, Pierman personality and Pierman flex index. In Pierman, we first understand our, our personality patterns um, through a focus of how we gain our mental energy. And after that, we look at how we take in our information. Is that through sensing or intuiting? And then after that, based on the information that we collected, how we make our decisions, thinking versus feeling. And Pierman also goes one layer deeper and look at these four functions, S and TF, uh, through the extroverted lens and introverted lens. The other part of the Pierman um, gives you your result about your resilience, your flexibility, and how you deal with the challenges of their day-to-day life. Um, so it looks at five subscales, uh, proactivity, composure, connectivity, variety seeking, and rejuvenation. So, um, most of you know probably the, the most uh, personality assessments and personality type assessments, um, they look at your natural preferences. They give you your, your result about your hardwired preferences. But what I'm going to do today, I'm going to introduce a new idea to this idea. Uh, that type actually does not predict your behavior. You know, sometimes um, life through task at us that might require us to come out of our comfort zone and demonstrated behaviors that is not comfortable for us. I don't know how many of you guys watch the movie Batman, but in Batman, um, he's Bruce during the day, but at night, you know, he's Batman. So sometimes, you know, we need to put that Batman mask on and demonstrate some behaviors that might not be comfortable for us. And Pierman takes, um, takes this into consideration. So Pierman have a more realistic approach uh, to the type assessment and it separates these two for you. So it gives you the information on both your natural type and your demonstrated behaviors. So this is one of the powerful feature of the Pierman. Um, so let's see how actually natural versus demonstrated appears in the report. Um, so this is one of the sample pages of a Pierman report. At the top of the page, you see a summary of your natural preferences versus your demonstrated behaviors. And at the bottom of the page, it gives you more details about each one of them. Also, Pierman does not just look at your four functions. It goes one layer deeper and it gives you the information about your mental functions in terms of natural and demonstrated. And sometimes, you know, can be some misalignment between these two. Um, so it highlights the part that there is some misalignment between your natural preferences and your demonstrated behaviors and actually gives you some text um, that it opens up some conversation between coaches and client that they can talk about if there's a stretch or a strain that the client experienced because of this misalignment. So, uh, you know, from time to time, we hear that um, people say, I don't know if I'm extroverted or I'm introverted. I kind of use both of them. Um, so the great um, thing about Pierman, it does not put you in a box. It doesn't tell you just that, oh, you're either E or I. It gives you a degree of your preference or usage of one function over another. So it puts you in a continuum. And one of the example here is the circular score, which we have in the Pierman, we use it. And um, so on the left side, you can see that this individual prefers E over I, but at the bottom of that, there is a number, which actually uh, there, there is a range between 51 to 99. And, and that 75 shows you this person moderately prefers E over I. On the right side of this picture, um, you can see that uh, this person demonstrated 
introverted behavior over extroverted behavior and the number gives you the degree of usage so this person is slightly used introverted behavior over extroverted behavior so these are very important information to have for coaches and it opens up a very rich conversation for our coaches so now you you all might wonder so what's the purpose of knowing all of this information? Now what? And um, so one of the fundamental uh, reason about knowing this information is awareness. Awareness about your natural preferences versus what you are required to demonstrate, how you wired and what the world expects of you um, to demonstrate. And is there any any challenges between these two? Do you feel any stretch between these two? And if you do, how do you manage this stretch? So um, these are all great information and you can apply it in so many different settings. But now I'm going to ask Heil, I'm going to pass it over to Heil to uh, show us how we can use this information um, with different exercises, specifically for team and leadership development. Yeah, thank you, Alnaz. It, um, it, it, when you um, were talking about this, Alnaz, one of the things you, you mentioned a number of times about this, the personalization of this report and the depth of this report, um, you, you mentioned a few times how this information really fed nicely, richly, uh, a, a conversation between a coach and her or his client, and and so that the the. the ways in which the Pierman is built for and services a coaching relationship, a personal uh, deep dive into self-awareness is clear. It's a stellar report in that regard. What, uh, what I wanted to make sure is we wanted to actually come together and make sure it was obvious to everybody that these data, the data you get from the Pierman, are also really rich in uh, their application to groups and to teams. So there are, are a number of nice kind of organizational applications that you can do as well. And so what we are going to, uh, what I want to show you here is um, a number of different activities that have been put together that actually help us to apply this in organizational life. We're going to take a look at team type. Um, there's a leadership type uh, activity. There's um, a, a product that really helps you drill into and, and understand and apply the mental functions of type. Um, and there's also uh, team resilience and uh, leadership resilience. Now, over the course of this webinar, we're going to highlight for you team type and leadership resilience of these five different kind of products and services, just so you could have a sense of what these are like. Um, let's take a look at team type first. And so, one of the um, things that has made type as a theory, as an overall model, one of the things that's made it so popular in the world is that it is so uh, easy to apply this to group level awareness. And, uh, and the Myers-Briggs is so popular in the world. One of the reasons is because it can so easily be applied to team life through the type table. Well, the um, the Pierman, while it offers you a very different approach, offers you something that's every bit as, as powerful, in some ways I think more useful. Let's take a look at, um, at this process. The team type process is set up around a deck of cards. So there are 24 cards and each card has a type rooted team behavior in it. So for instance, here's an example of a card that says the team meets readily and often, believing most work happens when the team connects. So this team behavior is actually an extroverted behavior. That's an extroversion behavior. And so on the back of each card, there is the, the name of the attitude or the function that that behavior represents. So here's, here's another just example. The team is visionary using imagination to suggest a future direction. Well, that's an intuition behavior that a team might engage in. So there, there are 24 of these cards. And what we ask a team to do is to do a forced sorting. So they're going to force these 24 cards into three groups of eight. 
of these 24 behaviors, there are going to be eight that the team engages uh, regularly, routinely. It's, it's our habit. It's our expectation. The way we work with each other is we engage these behaviors. They're front and center. They're the top eight. Well, that means they're going to be eight in the middle. Things we can do and do uh, engage in, but we they, they aren't up at the top. And frankly, there are eight that fall to the bottom, the things that they're kind of forgotten, rejected, overlooked, uh, really discounted. Sometimes there are behaviors that we collectively agree no, we don't want to do that. Um, we don't want to see it. We don't want to hear it. And so I asked the group to come together and, and sort the cards. And so when that happens, there's a sorting process that goes out. And so they, as they debate each one and put them in the stacks and what happens at the end of this process that by itself is really rich. It's the team debating and pushing and pulling and deciding what goes where. But what we wind up with are these three stacks of behaviors in each. Now, this card deck has a number of different exercises you can do with it, and we've detailed a number of them for you. For this discussion, I'm just going to uh, show you one that deals with the top eight. And so let's, uh, of these 24, here are the eight that we do most often, that we put the most stock in, that we expect the most from each other. And so let's just take those. We set the others aside. Um, when we... <laughs> We, we now need to transfer these eight behaviors to a team type poster. And so part of this exercise is uh, this printout that has all 24 of the behaviors here. Um, now this is printed in a nice laminated poster that you can actually have as a leave behind with the client. But you also get a PDF of this. So you can print it up and every team member can have her or his own copy. But the first thing we need to do is label the label this team poster. So what is this? This uh, Let's say this is the product development team. And when is this? It's important to, to focus this in time. And so the, let's say this was done today, September 19th. And then, well, we've chosen eight of these behaviors. What are they? And so the team can highlight or circle, somehow designate which are the eight behaviors that we most often do, most frequently, automatically engage in, what's most important to us. Um, once we've done that and highlighted those behaviors, we can then sign in. And so what I like to do is have the, the group members, let's say there's these seven members of the team, and have them actually sign in. Uh, if you want to uh, promote anonymity, you could have them do check marks instead of signing their names, just so we can see numbers rather than actual names. But if, if a team is open and willing, I, I'd like for them to actually sign in, be able to see. Um, and uh, so who is what? And what they're signing in is what their natural preference is. Uh, remember Al Nas was talking about the difference in natural and demonstrated. We're not interested in, in what is demonstrated right here we're interested in is how are you wired what are, what are your core preferences to see what is it like for you to be on this team and so what results is actually quite rich that we have a document uh that here that communicates a team's type and one of the things that's really interesting is that with with um the use of the myers-briggs and type that that culminates in a type table which i actually happen to like i do a lot of work with type tables but the problem with type tables is that you really need that's just a grid with people's names in it you really need to understand what type is to even know what that grid and those boxes mean this there's no interpretation needed because it's all right there this uh, uh it, that actually is a list of the behaviors and we've highlighted them and so anybody can pick this up and have some some good attachment to it and understand immediately what it means it facilitates a discussion about behavioral balance so for instance this team that we're looking at um clearly spends a lot more time and has a lot more expectations around extroversion than introversion. Extroverted behaviors are good and frequently engaged, and introversion is not, uh, is, is overlooked and, and kind of set aside. Same with thinking. We do a lot of objective um, decision-making, and subjective decision-making is really d discounted, overlooked, not, not as important. And so is that good for the team? Uh, would the team be better off with, with a little more F and with a little more introversion worked in? And so that's a great thing for the team to talk about. Um, it, this also prompts an interesting conversation that uh, about 
uh, minority and majority team preferences. Being very specific about it, what is it like for John as an introvert uh, on this team of, um, of, of, of many people whose natural preference is for extroversion and a team that expects a lot of extroversion? How much work is it for John to plug in to those behaviors? Um, how about Sue and Don? Uh, so to talk about what is the tension that's going to be on this team between the majority and the minority from a type perspective. This innate, this prompts a very supportive conversation about that. And frankly, it leaves, it's a leave behind that a team can have to reference, uh, to keep the learning going after the training. Um, that is uh, a key if you want to return investment on any training and Pearman, it's very important that we allow people, help people to do that. So that's a quick overview of team type. There are many exercises you can do with these team type cards. This is just one of them, but it's a pretty good one. Um, there's also a leadership card deck as well that a, another 24 set of cards that have um, that really focuses in on leadership um, and not uh, not teams. And the thought being that the um, that sometimes the focus is teams and group work, but sometimes it is leadership and uh, leaders or groups of leaders. And let's be able to focus the very same kinds of learning, but on that area, that topic, that segment of the population of, of the organization. And so that is um, all of the exercises that can be done within leadership type and team type uh, with those card decks and and the uh, adjoining um, or accompanying posters and PDFs that support all that are all detailed in this leadership um, uh, a team and leadership type facilitators guide. And so uh, how to do it, how to use them, the different ways that each of these card decks can be used. And so part of what you uh, get in this Pearman in Action kit is not only the card sets, but the facilitators guide that detail their usage. Uh, so now's a good time for us to pause and um, and hear from you. Uh, we've got a number of people on the on the webinar today, and so what what questions do you have about the about the tool, about the model, about the the exercises, and so far as we've talked about them so far, what's on your mind? Thanks, Heil. So we've had a lot of great questions coming through so far already. Um, I'll start with one for Elnaz. So the question is, I'm aware of the MBTI and it has a JP scale. Where are JP and the pyramid? Well, um, thank you, Becca. Actually, this is a very um, great question. Um, so uh, JP scale actually doesn't exist in Pierman. Um, JP scale were developed to create a way to determine the order of mental function for each type in MBTI. But um, so we don't have that in Pierman. But what Pearman offer, offers uh, compared to MBTI, um, you know, um, is uh, the data on natural or hardwired preferences versus the data on your demonstrated behavior, what you do. Um, another thing that actually um, uh, Pearman offers that, that MBTI doesn't is the, um, the data on all of the mental uh, functions um, in terms of natural and demonstrated. Um, it has a flex index, so it talks about your flexibility and it measures it through five different subscales. And also it focuses on individual type preferences, function and agility. And so it doesn't put you in a box. It doesn't provide you with a profile. It gives you, um, it puts you in a kind of a continuum. Um, so I know, Heil, uh, you are very familiar with both of the assessment, uh, both MBTI and Pearman. Uh, would you like to add anything um, to uh, you know, this question? Well, a little bit, but the, uh, your your answer is spot on. One of the things that um, that I have come to realize and really appreciate about the uh, about this as a type lover is that the, um, the the comparison of MBTI and Pearman, while it has to happen, they're both uh, they're they're the two leading tools in the type world. Um, it, it, it really is a fruitless comparison because they're apples and oranges. Uh, the, um, you're right that the JP scale was um, is not in the pyramid. It was actually a creation of Isabel Myers, the I would argue almost genius uh, creator of the of the Myers Briggs. But it's not Jungian, and so she. Uh, 
she implied uh, she she saw work that Jung kind of implied in his theory, and she pulled that implicit idea out to make it explicit in the tool. But that was a creation of Isabel Myers. One of the things that Roger Pierman wanted to do when he created this was one uh, to to go back to the source, to go to Jung's original work, and to produce something that psychometrically is is tighter is it that that more accurately focused in on what jung was after in the first place which was self-awareness leading to better development not categorization and the myers-briggs has for many many people slipped into a tool that's about sorting you about labeling you and um and just to your point elnaz that the the pyramid is uh, is very very clear that this doesn't label anybody. In fact, uh, one of the things that's a great benefit of the tool, and honestly, it's a frustration to some because they want to know, well, what's the answer? What's my label? What's my category? Where's my box? And none exists. And so this is about fluidity. It's about movement. It's about development. Um, it's not about labeling you. And one of the things that's most dramatic true that that lets you know that is the, um, the scores placed on a continuum and the lack of a JP function the lack of a JP answer so that's great yeah that's great well we'll do one more question for now this one's uh, for Hyle how is the knowledge of type applied and what kind of difference can this make for individuals and groups so the a lot of the, in terms of how is the knowledge uh, applied, the um, the real answer to that is that the 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 Pierman frames and and delivers information and insights, and the the exercises that we put together here is a way of kind of shaking the bushes and getting individuals, if they go through this card sort, or even the even groups to come together and and understand and kind of focus the information but the core of that question uh, about so how do we how do we use it how do we put it to to, to use depends on the individual um and so uh, the what um what the pyramid is about and what the what the training is uh, what these exercises are about is taking all of these data flex index teams type all of this because there's tons of stuff and really too much to do anything with i mean this, so uh, this is great insight but i need to take these 20 insights and hone them down to the two or three that seem most important to me now um and that's what these exercises are designed to do is to say of, of all this interesting information it's these two things it's these three cards it's this behavior that seems to be the one that's most needed, that's most wanted, or this tension that is most uh, uh, bedeviling us now. And so to focus down and, and give us a, a common goal, and then the degree to which I, as an individual learner, or the three of us as a small work group or team, actually decide to do something with that insight, that's totally up to us. Uh, and so the, the, the tool and these exercises are designed to give you an experience that focuses down, that has you lead with a, uh, a focused goal, a focused behavior, and it makes it that much easier to engage. But it's up to the individual learner or team whether they'll do that or not. Great. Thank you for addressing all of these questions. Uh, we're going to continue with the webinar now, so I'm going to pass it back to Elnaz, but we will have another question period at the end of the webinar, so please keep the questions coming. Well, thank you, Becca. Thank you for all of these wonderful questions. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, both Heil and I, we talked about um, natural preferences and, and demonstrated behaviors. But when there is a mismatch between um, your natural preference and your demonstrated behaviors, that can be challenging. For example, imagine um, that there's an individual who is naturally comfortable with sensing behaviors, who is detail focused, but must demonstrate 
intuitive behaviors, which is big picture focus. Um, so, you know, these differences can cause tension for this person. And and what happens if, if our job requires us to do things that doesn't come natural to us? Do we bend or are we going to break? Um, so that's why the second part of the pyramid comes into the play. So at first, it might not seem very connected, but actually, um, the important information about type is that stretch between your demonstrated behaviors and your natural preferences. And if our ability to flex is low, we might find ourselves um, you know, struggling to, to respond to the challenges of our daily life. Um, so let's uh, let's look at how actually flex index appears in the Pearman report. So this is one of the sample pages of the report, and and actually it gives you the information about your resilience, your flexibility, based on um, five different scales. So each scale uh, represented uh, in a bar graph, with actually the hundred is the average, and you can see where uh, people are highly engaged and where people are lacking and, you know, a less engaged. So again, it opens up a very rich conversation for coaches. Um, the other thing about Pearman is Pearman does not just look at your, your personality type or your flexibility. It gives you the information about your current estate, where you're standing right now. And then after that, it provides you with the tools and strategies that how you can get from your current estate to your desired estate using your flexibility, how you're going to uh, fill that gap between your current estate and your desired estate. So we have have a page, we have an action plan page um, in the in, in the Pearman report that actually you can come up with some measurable actions to work toward increasing your efficiency uh, in your personal life or in professional life. So now I'm going to hand it over to, to Heil um, to um, walk you guys through some of the exercises that actually we can do with this part of assessment. Yeah, thanks, Elnaz. The, uh, just as we wanted to make sure we put some activities together that was that helped users apply type, the type information within the pyramid to teams, groups, to leaders, uh, leaders and leadership, we wanted to do the same thing with the flex index information. How do you apply um, resilience, cognitive agility, and how do you apply those ideas? Uh, to leaders and to teams. So we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce this concept to you through um, uh, leadership. We'll show you the leadership resilience piece of this. This is also a card sort, but it's very different from the first one. And so the, the idea is that uh, a leader or a leadership group gets together and considers this behavior against these four frequency markers. And so how often do do leaders or do the leadership of this system engage this behavior? So leaders are quick to act on problems and engage potential solutions. So always, almost always, often, sometimes, never, almost never. How often do leaders in this system do that? Um, well, then we debate that. And so we decide, let's see, well, I, I think that's often. No, maybe that's always, almost always. So we go ahead and have that debate and determine, no, nope, that we, we think that we always or almost always do that, engage that behavior. Uh, all right. Well, there are 15 cards in this uh, process, in this um, deck here. And so we debate each one of them in terms of uh, how often do we do that. And we decide that some things we often do, sometimes some things that we never do. And we so we stack these cards. There are 15 of them. Well, here's an interesting thing about how these cards are made. Um, each of these uh, decks, 15 cards, has a resilience affirming or resilient supporting behavior on its front, the kind of blue side. Um, and so it's a, a, a behavior that supports or promotes resilience. And then on the back of the card is a behavior that does not support. It kind of cuts across or cuts against resilience 
from a leadership's perspective. Now, it's not necessarily a negative behavior. It just doesn't support resilience. For instance, leaders move methodically from one action to the next until objectives are achieved. That's a, a leadership resilience behavior. Well, the opposite of that behavior is when leaders approach problems and challenges sporadically and inconsistently. And so here's another one, just as an example. So leaders ask for and accept help from each other. Uh, well, the opposite of that behavior is a culture in which leaders value independence over cooperation, avoiding dependence on each other. Now, again, that's not a negative behavior. I've got a lot of cultures I work with and for who actually foster that kind of, they don't just fall into that behavior, that's actually what they want, that, that behavior on the right. So there are 15 of these cards. Um, when we go back to our, our focus, we are asking a leader or a leadership team to actually sort these behaviors from the blue side, from the leadership affirming behavior, and they've split them out accordingly. Once they've done that, we can actually do a really interesting process here. Let's take a look at the things that are under sometimes. So any behavior that is only sometimes engaged really suggests that the opposite of that behavior is actually something that's often engaged. So if this first behavior here, leaders openly share information and resources with their colleagues and subordinates. Um, if that's something that is only sometimes engaged, well, then that means that the opposite of that behavior, which happens to be leaders withhold information, sharing only as much as necessary to complete the task at hand, that that's actually something that we do often. Uh, and, and in fact, we can do that with the entire sometimes list, that, that everything that was put into sometimes, if we flip it over to the opposite uh, behavior, we can put that whole stack into often. And we could do the same thing with the never, almost ever. If we're never or almost never doing this resilience affirming behavior, what that actually means is that we are doing the behavior that actually cuts against resilience and we're doing that always or almost always. And so once we've stacked them this the the cards this way um, and again there's a, a detailed facilitators guide that walks you through this process but what you've got if you combine the cards now is you've got a stack of behaviors every one of which we often or almost always engage as leaders or as a leadership team now some of these behaviors support leadership uh, and uh, and organizational resilience and then some, of course, do not. Um, and those are separated nicely, easily by color. And so when we think about the so what, now that we've done this, one, this is a nice kind of portrait of our resilience. Here's a, if you read those behaviors, you see this is what our, our leadership behaviors look like. Look at how some of our leadership behaviors naturally support um, leadership effectiveness and resilience, and some do not. And so when you're thinking about developing resilience, what you're really talking about is doing these blue behaviors as much as possible and minimizing the green ones, or another way of thinking that is turning green to blue. If you take these behaviors, these kind of green behaviors we've designated, which is typical things we tend to do, but they aren't supporting leadership resilience, flipping them over and looking at here are the goals that we as leaders or as a leadership team have. And so when we take a look at that, so what's possible? If this is what we could do to increase our leadership resilience, what do we want to do? What are we able to do? Where's the low hanging fruit? We can go through and actually pick some of these as maybe being particularly urgent or um, being something where the payoff would be worth the pain and struggle of of engaging it but we could we could as a leadership team we could actually pick what do we collectively want to work on it goes to the question we had earlier in the webinar um, you know how can this kind of promote and support action well this is an exercise that helps you go from uh, the Pierman report to an interactive exercise to focus down so what do we need to do differently and then from that list shorten it still um, and that's the um, so, so that's the the concept um, in applying 
resilience to leadership. The same activity is designed, uh, has a supporting uh, team resilience um, a card deck. And so the same thing, but for a team to look at, uh, the, um, and that uh, is something that really helps to look at cognitive agility and, uh, and, and resilience and to tie that piece of the, of the pyramid, the flex index, into this process. And so what um, MHS has, has pulled together, this facilitator's kit that actually pulls all of these exercises together. It's the team and leadership behavior card decks and the posters and the facilitator's guide that takes you through those um, and the leadership and team resilience card decks and instructions on that. And in addition, actually my favorite piece of the of the kit is um, it, actually these uh, uh, function cards, and these are are nice laminated. They they look it's smaller than an uh, than a laptop, but larger than an e-reader. It's like a like an iPad size um, uh, card that actually details each of the eight functions and details a number of exercises. What can you do to actually get better at doing? this thing. I mean, uh, so how can you improve extroverted feeling? How can you work on your introverted sensing? Just like going into a gym and knowing certain exercises and certain activities that will work isolated muscle groups. That's what we're talking about in terms of type development through the pyramid lens is a targeted intentional movement toward individual type development. And this helps do that on the bottom floor, on the, on the uh, mental function floor. And so these, um, this type um, uh, function cards are particularly powerful in, um, in helping support that activity. So the, um, uh, now that we've gone through uh, kind of both parts, the type and flex index parts of the Pyramid, uh, talked about the model a little bit and introduced you to MHS's new um, experiential exercise kind of suite that are summed up in this Pyramid in Action kit. Um, what, what questions do you have? Um, and we can open it up and take on some of your thoughts. Thanks, Kyle. So we do have some questions coming through. The first one is for you. So the question is, on the team type exercise you explained, in your experience, is it optimal that teams have at least one person with a natural behavior in each of the mental function areas, leading to diversity within the team? And so, yeah, that's a great question. And it gets at the heart of um, our what's better, um, a diverse, from a typological standpoint, a diverse team or, or, or not, or, or kind of uh, whatever you get, you get. And my uh, answer might actually su surprise, but my belief is that it doesn't matter as much what the where people's natural preferences fall. Um, even if we're all the same, that that's still workable. Um, the 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 issue is, or the challenge is, can we as a team? Uh, note where we are and make up for um, what our challenges are. So, for instance, let's say that as a in our team type, that um, that we're all extra. We're all our natural preferences are all for extroversion, sensing, and feeling. Then that's so we're uh, very E, very S, very F as a team. Um, that uh, you could argue, yeah, that's not going to serve you well because you're 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 missing some of that re reflective, contained kind of I energy and N and T. I said, yes, but um, if we know that, um, if if we know as a team that our tendency is to go in this direction, um, we can overtly ch challenge ourselves and push ourselves. Um, to pull up those functions and that missing attitude ourselves. And so the, the solution I would argue shouldn't be, well, we need to go hire some other people of some other types. Um, because in a way that's assuming that takes me off the hook. And so my, my natural preference is for in, introversion, intuition and feeling. And so I should not rely on my colleagues to provide sensing for the team or to provide thinking for the team, because that's not my natural preference, but it's yours. So you cover that and 
that means I can check out on that. The better solution is for me to realize that my natural tendency might push me in one direction, but I'm still responsible as a member of the team, as a human, with those functions within me. I'm still responsible for being able to access and use competently even those things I don't prefer. And so I think the the benefit of any teamwork that you do with any tool, but especially with the Pyramid and the, the team, uh, uh, team behavior cards, is let's create a behavioral portrait. This is what we tend to act like, and that provokes us into talking about how is that helping us, because it is, and what are the potential downsides, because we have some of those too, and how are we as a team going to meet those and i think you can have that rich conversation regardless of what the display is um teams with a lot of sameness teams with a lot of diversity can both be equally um functional and and successful but they require self-awareness and uh, open discussion and problem solving so I, I hope that helps thank you that's great uh, so the next question is for Elnaz, and it's, why would someone want to demonstrate extroverted behavior if they are naturally introverted? Okay. Um, well, that's a great question. You know, um, sometimes uh, you, if you are if you are naturally an introverted person, right, and and you uh, you like you know to take uh, your time to reflect on your thoughts, but you know at life or like in your job, usually true task at you that um, you you are required to do. It's not about wanting, it, it's about you need to uh, demonstrate certain behaviors. For example, you, you need to, uh, f for example, if your job requires you to do some presentation and, and you have to stand in, in front of a crowd and, and do presentation and kind of uh, uh, network with them. So you're demonstrating extroverted behaviors. And, and this is something that um, that's when we are talking about these differences, right? You're demonstrating something that might not be natural for you, but if you increase your flexibility, you can you can learn some behaviors, right? If you practice more and more, for example, for a presentation, at first you might not be comfortable, but you will learn to actually demonstrate that behavior, that extroverted behavior, and, and you become good at it. And you you learn how to deal with the strain or that, that stretch of coming out of your comfort zone. So basically to answer your question is not about wanting, it's about that usually in our life, we are required to do things that uh, sometimes it doesn't come natural for us. And with Alnaz, uh, this is high. Let me jump in mm -hmm. just because that uh, that that question is so much my life. That um, my my natural preference is for introversion, but so much of my career is and has been uh, presentation and performance and engagement and uh, facilitation. And so I I'm I'm facing outwardly to the world more often than not. And my struggle with type historically has been this tension that I feel. I mean, I, so I think I'm an introvert, but I don't know. I do so much extrovert. No one believes I'm an, I'm an introvert. And, and, the, um, and so it, it has been the pyramid that has uh, enabled me to not only conceive of this differently, but actually measure it. That, that yeah, my natural preference is, is introversion. And I'm plugged into a world and a career that actually requires, just like you said, the other. Um, I, just as another illustration, I was working with a client just two days ago that, um, and she's uh, uh, a PhD physicist uh, and, um, and, and very, very bright uh, in, um, and very much natural tendency of T, of, of thinking, decision making. Um, and she talked about struggling when she went home because the skills and behaviors that she it needs to access when she engages her kids um, is so often around feeling and specifically extroverted feeling um, that um, they don't want to be taught lessons and they don't want to be um, uh, corrected and they don't want to be cr critiqued and, and oftentimes what they want from her in mom mode is 
hug me, love me, support me, emote to me. And, and, uh, and, and she can do that, but she has to consciously step out of where she naturally goes into this objective analytical T place. And she's got to almost like she's digging in a bag to find where is that, where is that tool? Here it is and pull it up. And that's, uh, and, and that's what we as humans do when we're successful. Um, the Pearman, for the first time, allows us to actually measure it and talk about it. Thank you both. Um, so the next question is for Heil, and it's, should I move from MBTI to Pearman or use both? Uh, well, that's a that's a good question. The uh, it, should you no? I I wouldn't say that there's this isn't about should. Uh, the um, there are are benefits to both. The um, that one of the things that um, in in terms of w what my clients have said over the last uh, almost three years that that uh, Pearman has been uh, around and available. There, uh, there are many people in the world that have experienced MBTI um, and that, that are over it. I can't tell you how many people have said over the last decade, so what do you, what do you have? What can you use? And don't say the Myers-Briggs, uh, just because they've done that before. They feel like they understand it. And, and so I, I think actually if they opened up and heard a really good job with the Myers-Briggs that they, they'd – still be interested but rather than fight that fight here let's talk about type um in a brand new way um there are people who really um struggle uh in terms so now i'm just emphasizing the people for whom pierman will be more um interesting for you or, or useful for you that there are um the younger my group has gotten, the more millennial people born since uh, 1981 uh, that uh, that my crowd has gotten over the years, the more natural pushback there has been to the concept of type as delivered through Myers-Briggs, this dichotomous either or, you're this or you're that. Um, the, the younger the learner is, the more they resist this binary view of anything. Um, and so the, the idea of, of having to, to force a choice is, is binding. Taking the Myers-Briggs is chafing and the results seem like it forces a falseness on to many, many people. Um, and, and the pyramid is seen as a real breath of fresh air for those folks because it, 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 there's, there's no issue. There's a woman in my office today who's, uh, who's trying to decide what her type is. She's getting ready for a Myers-Briggs class. And, and, the, um, and so she's really struggling with, am I a this or a that? that? There's no beating your head against that wall with the pyramid. Because the wall is gone, there isn't a, uh, a, a, a and and so, in, if you fought any of that energy or had any of that energy in your, um, in your groups, and I have had an increasing amount, I think the Pearman will give you a, a a very interesting and really rich new avenue into this, um, into this field, and a lot of the fights that you've had to have or wrestling matches cognitively with your with your groups, they're they're gone, and that makes it a lot easier. So should you should you switch? No, there's no should there. Just realize there's a lot of benefit to this new tool. Um, the um, uh, there you do not one does not need the other, and so you it's not like Myers-Briggs is a good first step and this is a good second step. I would not do that. Uh, I think it's fine to continue y using whatever you started with. Um, and, um, and so that means that, uh, that, that a lot of people who are just now thinking about it looks like two thirds of the people on this uh, webinar don't have a type tool in their, on their belt or in their organization. And so uh, Pierman would be a great way to start. Thank you, Heil. So um, in line with that, do you need to be certified to use the Pyramid? And if so, how do you get certified? Since I was already talking, I'll just jump in with that one. Yeah, you do. It is a level B instrument, and so it does require certification. That's actually good because the there's enough richness to the uh, material, and there's enough sensitivity to the information that it. Um, I, I think it it requires somebody who's really comfortable with the model and and how to read and and apply the uh, the material. But uh, and there are. Um, 
a number of of organizations uh, around the world, actually, but around uh, North America that actually provide uh, the training. We're one of those. OKA is one of the leading providers of certification training. And um, and one of the things I like is being able to have having uh, been the actually leading provider of MBTI certification in the world for so long. It was uh, nice to uh, it, it's nice to be so steeped in both as we're teaching uh, Pierman. But the um, it's a two day uh, process and there is a, an in person option and an online option. The in person option here for uh, OK is in Fairfax, Virginia, uh, but there are also online options as well. And you get not only the, the, the background in type theory, and this is with with uh, anybody that you take the pyramid certification with, you get the uh, you get steeped in the theory as well as how to use and interpret the tool, you get practice in coaching with the tool, and you get introduced to all of the experiential exercises that we just uh, kind of quickly introduced you to here. So lots of certification options for anybody who's, who's interested in that. Great. So thank you so much, Heil and Elna. So just to wrap uh, the webinar up, for those of you in the US and Canada within this map, you, of, you can find your state and the information of the MHS representative that can support you with any requests in your region. Or if you're in any other country outside of North America, you can contact our International Partners Relations Consultant. Of course, you can always reach out directly to Heil should you have any additional questions about the assessment or if you're interested in getting certified by him. Thank you for attending today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.